devastating because it damaged the environment significantly in and around uh, Kandy. That was uh, uh, unfortunate. But uh, what evolved from there was a very successful coffee industry. And eventually, um, on the ashes of that industry, because that industry suffered a blight, uh, which uh, more or less in the years leading up to 1867, when uh, young Scotsman James Taylor, he experimented with uh, uh, tea, again, uh, taking plants from Peradenia, uh, where it had already been tried because they had been brought in from Assam, from the jungles of Assam. And uh, there was the birth, 1867 was the birth of our great uh, tea industry. All right. So, so we, we, we have in the early 1800s, uh, the tea industry, uh, and then we had uh, the, the British who, who's done most of the planting uh, back, back in the day. And then we have brands like yourselves that evolved, uh, I believe with uh, your dad's um, uh, venturing into the in industry starting very small. Could you just tell us how Dilma came into the journey of the tea industry and when did it happen and how did it all happen? Maybe at this point, I'll uh, put something up um, and uh, maybe share the screen. So, uh, um, right, hopefully, hopefully you should see something now. Yes. Great. So, um, okay. So, um, this might give a little indication uh, I'd like to maybe show you the timeline. Uh, it was in 1930 that uh, my father was born uh, in a very humble village. What is uh, relevant about his story is the fact that uh, he was an ordinary Sri Lankan from an ordinary background. But uh, Sorry, Dilha, we, 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 we see your Zoom screen. Uh, we still can't see the presentation. We see your Zoom screen. My apologies. Uh, How does that look? Do you Perfect. see it now? Perfect. Great. So, um, Louis, the my father's story is especially significant because he came from a very simple, uh, he, he came from the village Palatsena in uh, near Digambo. So really an unexceptional lower middle class Sri Lankan family. But of course he possessed a few attributes which uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, in a moment in context of uh, your own students' uh, aspirations. And you can see the timeline of the business. It was eventually uh, in 1958, uh, I'm sorry, when he was 58, that would be 1988, that Dilma was born. And why this gap? Well, simply because at that time, there were no Sri Lankans who were permitted into the tea industry. I mean, there was various things that they said uh, uh, um, it was, uh, we eat too much curry, too much spice, and therefore we can't taste the subtlety of, of uh, uh, different teas. But it was, of course, to preserve their visas, to preserve the role of the British uh, at the time. And uh, eventually it was uh, uh, in the 1950s that the first batch of Sri Lankans were allowed into Mincing Lane to do, to taste and so on. And my father was amongst them. There were six of them, I think, at, at that time. They went, uh, spent some time in Mincing Lane, learned the art of tasting. And from the time my father came back in 1950, he uh, really wa he was driven to build his own brand because I think while he was in England, he saw the futility uh, of what was happening to our tea industry. Our tea taken to England, it was mixed with uh, tea from other origins and uh, still with the label Pure Ceylon Tea, it was marketed. And so as a Sri Lankan, of course, then they were known as Ceylonese. He came back wanting to build a real pure Ceylon tea brand uh, that was genuinely pure. And uh, you know the odds were stacked, so it took him nearly 40 years. And in 88, Dilma was born. OK, so, so, so that's, that's a rich uh, heritage and a journey. And, and I, I see uh, now you, you're part of the second generation and perhaps your kids are part of the third generation uh, of, of what's going to happen. Um, you, you're now in over 100 countries around the globe. But could you tell us what was the turning point? Where did it all, uh, what, what was the spurt of growth? Where did it start to, what was this hockey stick effect? And where did it really start to trend and grow as, as the organization? Could you just... Uh, perhaps shed some light on that. 
You know, we started as a very simple, small organization. I mean, it started uh, with a relatively small office, then with uh, one machine uh, in the uh, uh, 80, in the late 70s and then into the 80s. And of course, you know, you must remember that at that time, our, our country was going through conflict. There was various uh, political and, and other instability. But I think what my father did that, that, stand, that, that allowed us to develop in the way that we, we have now is his persistence, his, his commitment. And if you, if you ask me the story of Dilma, it is essentially the heart of it is the passion of one man, my father. But then to complement that passion, of course, was a great vision. The vision was not simply of making money because making money is, I suppose, something that many people can do in different ways, but the vision was much greater than simply commercial success. And so having that vision, it was emboldened or it was made possible through commitment, through perseverance, because commitment is great, but he met with so many obstacles. Some of them included, for example, the freight rates to Australia at the time, being increased artificially simply for his product, because at that time, of course, uh, uh, his, his own peers, as much as uh, the opposition, their comp competition were against him and didn't want him to succeed. And so he, he found a situation where packed or branded tea into Australia was uh, uh, more expensive to ship than uh, bulk tea, which, which absolutely makes no sense, but that was part of the anti uh, or the unfair, unethical um, practices that were, were used against him. And uh, I, I think that if, you, if we go back to where the brand really began to grow, I would say it would be in the mid 2000s, so around uh, uh, 2000, 2005. But what's important to remember, particularly bearing in mind the fact that we are talking uh, with, uh, with, uh, mostly with a group of your students, is the fact that uh, you, you cannot say that there was an inflection point at which suddenly there was exponential growth. But no, every single step that we took from, you know, we were never a local brand. We were always an export brand initially, and it's only latterly that we came to Sri Lanka. But from the very first market, whether it was the Maldives with, uh, uh, with a, a small LCL a pallet load of, of stock, or whether it was Russia with four or 500 containers a year, Every single step contributed to what the brand is today. And the most important thing along that journey was the commitment to maintaining an uncompromising emphasis on the founding principles. You know, and why I say that is that so often we are challenged, and I know that many of our competitors or many of our colleagues in the industry and your students will be challenged to compromise on the founding principles. So when you design a brand, around integrity, around quality, and so on. Um, it's, it's easy for someone to come along and say, hey, I'll take 20 containers off you, but you know, uh, I need this. I need you to mix uh, this tea with this, and, and so on. So compromising the principles of authenticity, purity of origin, and so on. Uh, it seems lucrative, but I think that it is our perseverance, my father's absolute uncompromising insistence on maintaining the founding principles, even at commercial loss, in, in many cases, we lost some, what we thought were great opportunities, but what we realized were short-term opportunities. And so I think we came to that inflection point based on this very, very firm foundation of integrity. Fantastic. Uh, you know, you are today a, a top 10, the top 10, you're in the top 10 tea brands in the world. I don't know whether you're number six or eight. I don't know, it might change year on year, but you are, you are the top 10 tea brand in the world. And what's fascinating about it is it's your name. Uh, it's your name as well as your brother's name, um, you know? And uh, I'd like to ask you, we'd like to hear as, as a 19 year old who joined the organization, uh, at a very young age. I'm sure uh, by then there's some export business that had been developed. What was your ambition? How did you transform? How did, uh, what kind of strategies do, did you embrace uh, from a 19 year old to grow the organization and be the CEO uh, in the driving seat? Uh, what kind of ambitions did you have and what kind of journey did you go through? Would you, would you mind sharing that if it's not too personal? 
I would love to tell you that I had a grand ambition and a beautiful vision, but I must tell you, coming straight out of university, I didn't. I knew nothing. I uh, came out of the uh, London School of Economics. I spent uh, 10 years in England. I thought I knew everything, but it's only latterly that I realized that, in fact, um, it, it, it is through the uh, people call it the school of hard knocks that you really, you know, through getting battered and realizing the practical reality of commerce that you can really use. I'm not saying that formal education is a waste. No, absolutely not. It provides the framework without which uh, no entrepreneur can work. But what uh, reality, what the practical reality that, that I am, came across when I came back what, what it did was really temper that. And, give, and, and I can tell you that today, what the, that education does is it creates an enabling environment, enabling framework to understand new technologies, to understand the need to build uh, AI, to build precision agriculture too. Because quite often there, there are situations where people may, may be inflexible. And I think uh, the formal education was critical, but it's important to understand that whenever you, when you start on your journey in life, you need to really refine, you know, it's like uh, what you say, the, the Japanese, when they make the samurai sword, uh, it goes through an incredible uh, temperature. I, I don't know the numbers, but it goes through incredible temperature and the hotter it is, uh, the, the uh, uh, finer the steel and so on. And so that trial by fire, that refinement is absolutely critical in any environment simply because um, with the theoretical knowledge, uh, you have a great asset. Yes, you can go and work uh, in any business. You can probably succeed in any business. But where you can make a difference is by marrying that knowledge with uh, a passion and a commitment for an industry and with a purpose. And I think for me, more than anything, the purpose that my father built into the, the foundation of our business, saying that business is a matter of human service, that is what makes the difference. I, I, I suppose in any instance, uh, it, it would be fantastically fulfilling to go and work. I mean, you know, when I came out of the LSE on, on, at graduation, you get, uh, uh, you get lots of companies that come, uh, you know, the, the accountancy firms, et cetera, that come and say, you know, you can give you a job, we can give you this, 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 this. Uh, it, it sounds very attractive, but actually, um, and I'm sure those would have been successful. And for your students, those will also be successful. But when you come, come, come back to Sri Lanka and when, your vision, your knowledge is, is galvanized with a purpose that is national, that is social. It is far more fulfilling than any um, commercial success. And, and you know, that's maybe, maybe I'll, I'll would, you, would you like me to go into some of that now, Louis? Or? Sure. No, sure, sure. Maybe I'll explain something about the business so that you could, you could sort of understand, you know, the business is formed on, on three pillars. Taste, of course, because my father's uh, uh, core objective is to, to, to share the pleasure in, uh, in fine tea. So purity of origin, taste, when, I, when you talk about taste in tea, it's not simply tea that is with milk or sugar or, or not, but it is uh, the, the terroirs, the different uh, uh, teas from different microclimates, seasonal teas, etc., to really present an experience rather than uh, simply a cup of tea. And that combines innovation and so on. But then the goodness, you know, for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, uh, pleasure to be working with a product that we know has this antioxidant goodness. It, has, it, it is something that we know is good for our consumer. And today I know there's so many fantastic products, some not so fantastic, which are really good, but still might harm the environment. Or might, In tea, of course, the monoculture is not a great thing, but it's something that we can do something about. And so the goodness in the antioxidants is, is something uh, uh, that really inspires us. But ultimately, what goes beyond the conventional definition of success, which is commercial, is the purpose of our business. Because it takes the business from what we would define as conventional success to, to a level of significance that is really far more fulfilling. And I can tell you, I mean, a couple of days ago, somebody came and told me that uh, uh, we have uh, three or four judges amongst the, the children of tea pickers who have been through our scholarship program. Now, that kind of fulfillment is, uh, it's impossible to achieve commercially. And if you look at, uh, uh, I don't know if you have seen some of the work of our foundation, maybe, maybe I'll show you uh, a little bit. I mean, this kind of stuff, uh, 
uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to that and just talk to you a little bit uh, about that. Uh, I mean, these are areas that you know of, but our brand um, essentially is part of an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is based on these principles. So the taste, the goodness, and the purpose are critical. But then if you look at the, the challenges that our world is facing today, if we as businesses are not part of the solution, then we are subscribing to a conventional, dated, and really uh, quite a parasitic concept of business. You know, in the there are various movies. I don't know. I think you guys are too young to know Casablanca and all of these movies. But most of them um, talk about business people as something quite evil. Maybe something more recent, Wall Street. You can see how awful those people are because of their single-minded focus on money. But ultimately. If you really look at the, the, the role of business, particularly post-COVID, today we have seen every single pre-existing social and economic condition that we have in our world, inequality, gender issues, if you look at race issues, so many issues that are inflamed by the current situation. They are underlined post-COVID and particularly climate change. And so if you take all of those and really consider at a moral level, that it is an obligation not only of an individual or a business to begin to address that, a business has incredible ability to do it. Because simply, if you look at climate change, since 2005, since the, um, so, so, um, the Stern report, since uh, uh, the British government's Stern report, um, the solutions were obvious. They were there. But the question is how we share them, how we engage with, with people. Now, we, we do that. We started a concept called climate reality. Uh, we work with, we started a, a, well, we were part of a initiating, three initiating partners, the Chamber of Commerce, IUCN and us, which started Biodiversity Sri Lanka, talking to other businesses and say, hey, look, we've got these issues. We've got inequality. We've got uh, biodiversity loss. We've got uh, climate change, but there are solutions and we need to do something. And by being a part of the solution, I can tell you it has enriched our business. It's not only this. I mean, if you look at uh, working with the uh, UNGC, working uh, well, the National Center for children with cerebral palsy, incredibly fulfilling. Children, uh, youth with cerebral palsy, with, with Down syndrome, with other developmental disorders, we're able to take them from a restrictive, uh, almost an imprisoned environment and bring them and, and actually look beyond their disability and focus on their ability. Now, this is something that a business can. Why? Because we can access resources. We can make calls to, to doctors uh, overseas and say, hey, come and guide us, tell us what we should do. So a business has a certain responsibility. And I think by acknowledging that responsibility, harnessing it, we can not only do good ourselves, but we can also build on this other pillar of ours, which is to be an advocate to bring in government. So at Biodiversity Sri Lanka, we're very honored that we have government representatives, we have private sector, because today the scale of the problems are such that whether a government, a business or an individual alone, there's no way that we can fix it. By, but, but through collaboration, there's a lot we can do. Otherwise, you know, we might end up, people say, oh, they're a lovely business. They did so many good things. That's a random act of good, whether it is environmental or social. Yeah, it's nice, but it's not going to change, change much. Yeah, so, if, if, if I may just ask you, could you just, could you just give us a feeling of the scale of your operation? I, I understand you produce 2,000 bags per minute. Uh, could you could you just tell us a little bit? Of, we know that you're in 100 plus markets. Uh, is there anything that we don't know that you could tell us for us to understand the scale of this operation that goes from your tea factory to tea plucking? I mean, you've you've taken control of uh, the entire vertical, from bagging to buying to exporting to even uh, sort of diversifying into some related industries like the packaging industry. So could you just give us the, the scale of your business at the moment? Uh, Louis, uh, not 2000, we have machines that produce 2000 bags a minute, but I think on, a, on an average day, to be honest, I haven't calculated it recently, we pro probably produce around five to six million uh, tea bags or cups of tea. And uh, um, yeah, they, they currently go around, I mean, they, they go to uh, over 100 countries around the world. But I think what, what I would like to emphasize there is, yes, um, the, the, the number is important, 
but our focus is much more on 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 the positioning on the practical aspects of of taking the product to market and and maybe maybe I'll explain a few things you know if you look typically at uh, uh, the sri lankan tea plantation sector the sector is uh, characterized by uh, gender issues social issues etc but ultimately this concept of a living wage it's a, it's a critical concept and sri lanka does pay the highest wages uh, for uh, for plant for the plantation sector relative of course to other uh, major producers but the concept of a living wage necessarily involves the buyer the the marketing factors because if you have a tea industry in sri lanka that is catering purely to private label or catering to bulk tea there's no way we are going to be able to build the 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 the, the margins that will allow us to to deliver a living wage not only in in tea plantations but in uh, packaging etc etc and so i think for this marketing is a critical enabler and so for your students what i would like to 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 say is it's very important that your marketing message and your marketing proposition is tailored to your resource so in our case we have a high cost but necessarily a uh, 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 high quality you know ceylon tea has uh, has a unique name so if you look in comparison with uh, teas from uh, much cheaper origins indonesia uh, vietnam and so on we cannot compete on price we can never compete on price and so if you look at our national our of a national export average sadly it's too close to our national cost of production i mean i, I don't think there's even a, a 200 rupee uh, difference between the cost of production and the uh, uh, and the, the national export average now that's a crime in our case our export average is something like uh, i think 2400 2500 rupees a kilo whereas sadly most of the industry is hovering around 6 7 800 rupees so ultimately i think that we need to focus on a strong differentiation because our, our asset is our sri lankan tea plantations we can never disconnect the marketing of ceylon tea with the interest of the tea plantations and so um what i would like to to add there is that we have to bear in mind that we have a very traditional method so many people will look at it look at uh, kenya look at the machine that produces that harvests 6000 kilos a day which is a, a self calibrating uh, uh, robotic uh, uh, picker and would say wow that's a way to go yeah it is the way to go but the important thing is that today we have a particular set of circumstances in sri lanka where we can't do that overnight and so we need to uh, we need to gear our marketing message we need to gear our brands we need to gear our our message to the world with the artisanship with the the, the variation the, the microclimates the muscular teas with the regional teas the rattapur they're all fundamentally different now most of us know that you know if you want thickness intensity you want uh, uh, chocolatey notes you're going down to gold you're going on to rattapura but then you go to newer elia you know it's sometimes honey like it's so there is this spectrum of taste that we can we could focus on so this is what i mean by aligning our product and aligning our marketing message and proposition with our resource and uh, really that's what we do because every day you have a hand picked leaf and ultimately every cup of tea uh, has uh, what 30 35 hand picked leaves and buds so that's something that's pretty incredible so my request or my suggestion to your students is yes the whole industry is trying to compete on a global scale okay that's okay if you're producing uh, uh, if you're producing wooden boxes or something that doesn't have a national dimension national social dimension in sri lanka but tea has a national social dimension it has 3 million people who are directly or indirectly dependent on it and so in order to be able to align ourselves with national social economic uh, uh, priorities it is absolutely critical that we build on differentiation of course that's a core marketing message which i'm sure you're constantly telling them about <laughs> absolutely and uh, uh, it, it's it's amazing to see uh, you know the entire ecosystem that i see on the screen at the moment in terms of the different uh, initiatives and the brands but could you also tell us i'm sure your dad or yourself would have faced lots of challenges uh, we we've seen in in the last two years uh, certain issues with the exports to russia 
you know, we've seen it in the news that the, that the Ceylon tea has uh, had some level of impact. We've seen the tensions in the Middle East, the US sanctions. We've also seen some challenges in, in the European region. Uh, we are also strong in some markets. Uh, uh, what kind of challenges do you envisage uh, or did you have along the way and perhaps how you manage to overcome uh, some of them big challenges? Louis, I would say that there's a simple principle. You have to market to the generation that you live in. I'm sure that's, I'm stating the obvious for you, but the point is that we continue to work around traditional markets Libya, Iraq, Iran, et cetera, and um, Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. But, uh, you know, there is, a, uh, there is a vulnerability in focusing on those traditional markets. It's, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, ashamed to even tell you that because I mean, that's stated the obvious, but unfortunately, uh, many in our tea industry don't actually realize that. And this is where we have tried to be different because, uh, when you go into Italy, as an example, it's a completely different set of requirements. You need to be very innovative. You need to be very different. You need to adapt. I mean, that's that's a, a basic part of marketing. But the point is that in Sri Lanka, in in Ceylon tea, in in the product that we produce and the multitude of different terroirs that we offer, you have every single thing that you need to cater to a North American, Canadian, uh, uh, Latin American, English, etc. And and this is the thing. I, I would say that if I talk about a challenge, the biggest challenge we have is the mindset. So we need to understand that in the 21st century, it is no longer about price. I mean, of course it is about price, but the price market is the, the, the mass market, which is price driven and the discount culture in retail is completely beyond the realm of possibility for us. So we need to look beyond. And when you say look beyond, it is about looking at uh, uh, specialities. It is about looking at value addition in a, in a sincere form. It is about real iced tea. If you look around the world, what is iced tea? It is the most uh, highly sugared, highly flavored. And this is, I'm not talking about uh, Sri Lankan companies doing this, but at a global level, we have abdicated the uh, ownership of iced tea to this highly sugared, highly flavored and really bad product. But what is Sri Lankan iced tea? I mean. We have the possibility now. We have established a factory. We are doing, we are reimagining. I'm not saying that we are perfect, but what I'm saying is that we need a different mindset to understand the consumer and to break away from the past in order to, to see that, for example, in North America, it might be tea gastronomy. I'll, I'll, I think I have, uh, uh, I have a couple of slides that, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, uh, it, it's a concept that we have. It's, it's called tea inspiration for the 21st century. Now we go around the world um, okay. uh, we go around the world talking to chefs, talking to mixologists, talking to them about, uh, about uh, tea, about how tea works with different types of food, how tea infused, and looking at new methods of, of uh, cooking, using teas, and so on. So um, if, uh, you know, and, and this didn't come out of any extensive research, and I, I want to add that, you know, a lot of people think that we are this big brand that has access to unlimited resources. We are not. And the research for this simply came about by looking online at a free, very uh, uh, free resource of, of searching and trying to see what are the top progr television programs in each market. And what I found, I mean, going back to the 1990s, uh, was that uh, it was food in every instance. I mean, okay, at that time, it was, a, it was a top one or two. Today, it's the top five out of five is something to do with food. And so we built our tea gastronomy program, which is real high tea, chef and the tea maker, tea in five senses, all of these, and the school of tea around that proposition. And that has helped us not only to, you know, with a competition like this, it's great to engage with, with consumers and, and with the professionals with the trade. But what is equally important is about learning from them and being able to, to, to uh, feed your uh, innovation. And so that, that's really what happened. We learned about new flavors, new ingredients. We learned about new uh, culinary methods. And of course, we built uh, our, our connection. So I think innovation. So the biggest challenge we have today is a fear of innovation, but also a fear of marketing. And why I say that is that marketing is really expensive. But marketing is, as you know, it's, 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 in a, it's a fantastically dynamic 
area where today it's uh, yeah it's expensive but uh, if you do the right thing, the returns are there. So it's, you know, I think people still talk about big TV program, TV campaigns and so on. But in our case, when I say that we are not this uh, typical big company is that, look, sometimes it starts with uh, a LinkedIn group. I mean, in some countries, it's, uh, we start with Facebook because we simply can't afford the kind of marketing that uh, people say. And Facebook means we have a guy uh, in our office who's uh, populating it, you know, we have a uh, translator who's helping. It's a very simple operation. I'm saying this because I meet so many people who say, look, it's easy for you. It's not easy for us. It's not easy for anyone because we have the commitment. And what we have done is also possible for every one of your students. And I, I really want to encourage them. If you get your alignment uh, and if you get, if you ground yourself in reality, whether your market is Colombo or if it is one street in Colombo, I can tell you in some cases, you know, when we launched our tea launch, uh, going back uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, 2013, we started by producing little cards, uh, which uh, uh, said something, something silly, like it had like, two lips on it and it said, I think you're hot. And we put those cards on the desks of people uh, working in uh, the, the WTC, in the, the Twin Towers, in the towers here. And when you open it, it says uh, something like, chill out at the tea lounge and come out here and here's a voucher. Now, I got a friend of mine to get his peon to go and deliver these. And that's how we started the concept at that time, simply because we, we couldn't afford to, to invest in, in the kind of campaigns that uh, maybe we can afford now. But we still do that. If, if you look at uh, some territories, I can tell you the UK. In the UK, you have a very uh, discount-driven retail sector. So we exited that sector. And seven years later, we are going back in. But we're going back in office by office. So sometimes when I, uh, I have the opportunity of being around, I go into uh, an office and I do a tasting demonstration. We taste, we, we put a little bit of alcohol, we come up with different, dish different uh, drinks. And we try to understand the customer. We try to build signature experiences for them and um, engage. It's, it's really as simple as that. So whether it is at a group level of a large, uh, uh, I don't know, auto grill or large uh, uh, group, or whether it is at a smaller level, what is most important is that commitment, that knowledge, uh, and that passion. Because once the customer sees that, you know, I, I still go into cafes and, and do a marketing thing. I mean, I, I had to do it by, by Zoom today, earlier on today, uh, where we were talking about different ingredients, where we were looking at uh, how, you know, because there is a big localization trend. So we have to substitute some of our ingredients in certain territories. And so we work with this. We work now, if a cafe demands it, um, we, don't, we don't focus on their quantities. We focus on... Uh, uh, on getting it done. Right. Just, just a question because we have we have some students who are who are doing uh, the case study on global marketing decisions. Yes. Uh, in terms of China and the whole Belt and Road, uh, how do you see the opportunity around the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, do you see China as an opportunity, or is is China a threat? I think China is a phenomenal opportunity. And uh, uh, even where tea is concerned, there is, a, uh, there is a uniqueness around Sri Lankan tea based on its purity and its cleanliness and so on. And so where China is concerned, the only thing is that there is, there is a, a huge cultural, um, can't say a barrier, but there is a very significant level of adaptation that is required. So in, in China, the level of, of uh, technological sophistication is phenomenal. So my advice to anyone who's involved in, in uh, China or aspires to be involved in China is go to Shanghai, mm -hmm. spend some time there and watch how differently consumers engage with brands. It is fundamentally different and it is instant. Uh, as an example, last year when I was uh, uh, there, on the, we, we, had, we had a school of tea uh, we talked, I mean, it was a little bit ironic that we, here, is a, here are a few Sri Lankans going across to China to talk to them about tea, which actually originated in China uh, a while ago. But um, the fact is that uh, at that point, you know, we were trying to work, work out, I placed a, a trial order 
for live fish at Garuba, which from the moment we clicked, uh, it was WhatsApp. Uh, no, it, uh, not, not WhatsApp. They've got, uh, Josh, they've got their version of WhatsApp. Sorry, it escapes me right now. And what uh, happened from the moment I placed that order with, with our distributor was that within 30 minutes, a live fish was delivered in a beautifully packed, of course, very plastic uh, container. And that is, is a principle. So it's about convenience. And so based on that experience, we adapted a lot of our uh, strategy. We focused a lot more on, on uh, uh, convenience stores, on, on the uh, smaller, uh, well, now, now the local store concept and, and moved a little bit away from the hypermarkets, which actually coincidentally globally are having a little bit of a tough time. So I would say China is a fantastic opportunity, but of course you can't generalize because there are some products that uh, offer opportunity in China. And I think health and wellness, that whole sector around food is a great opportunity, but we've got to get the product right. All right. I've got a bit of a broader question, a bit of a macro question for you concerning, uh, because you are not only Sri Lanka's largest player, you're also one of the biggest players in the world. Um, can the green gold of Sri Lanka save our economy? Do you have any hope? Could we build a strategy? Uh, could we build a strategy much like perhaps South Korea has, has been built around uh, Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, and LG? Uh, could we have a cohesive strategy that perhaps uh, a few brands like yours uh, that aspire to maybe one day be the number one key brand in the world? Uh, is that on your mind? And what role could you play uh, in fulfilling that, in, in, in making many more brands, uh, you know, join the bandwagon of being global brands, even outside the tea industry? I'm an eternal optimist and my, the short answer is yes, it is possible. It's possible because we have some brilliant teas and we have, uh, we have an enduring connection with our tea industry. Uh, but it requires certain things, certain changes. And most importantly, it requires the alignment of academia, that is innovation, so research, with uh, business, with government, and the regulatory authorities. At the moment, unfortunately, uh, each is uh, on its own trajectory. And when that happens, you don't have the possibility to, to innovate the way you should. So, for example, we need uh, a, a national quality infrastructure desperately to be able to tell us uh, if there is something bad in our teas, you know, to be able to, to uh, address malpractices in the tea industry. There's so much that needs to be done. But uh, most of the product has, most of the uh, samples have to be assessed overseas. So that's not a good thing. We need to build a national quality infrastructure. We need to build a, a research infrastructure. We need to extend that through to the, the businesses and government to work in partnership. And as for your question, whether there is a possibility for the tea industry to, to save the country, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say save the country, but I think to, to substantially increase its contribution to the national economy, yes. And simple fact is, as I mentioned earlier, you have, between, you have a cost of production of say, uh, just under 500 rupees a kilo. You have a national uh, export FOB average of say seven eight hundred rupees. You have uh, you have a couple of brands. I think there's uh, Dilma at two thousand eight hundred. There's Basilur uh, around two thousand four two thousand five. Uh, either way, there's a couple of brands over two thousand. I mean, I'm talking about the brands that are exporting in some volume. Um, you know, there you clearly see the opportunity of realigning everyone to say, look, we will sing off one hymn sheet. We will talk about quality, 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 sustainability, purity, etc. The problem is that when we, if you, well, actually, you, you, you can walk into, uh, walk into a supermarket in, in Poland, you will see Dilma premium Ceylon 100s priced at 16 zloty. And you will see, unfortunately, our competitors who have priced their Ceylon tea at four, five, six, seven, eight, sorting. So in this environment, you can clearly see that there is a misalignment in our industry. Now, if we were all to say, look, we are not cheap, we are the best in the world, and therefore we are going to charge that best in the world price, 
yes, then you have the possibility to, to uh, really make a huge, a much more significant contribution to the national economy. All right. In terms of substitution, um, I'm, I'm a big tea drinker, but I'm also, I also like my coffee. Uh, what kind of substitutes do you think might disrupt the growth of the tea industry? We have lots of other factors geopolitically that are impacting the, uh, the tea industry, but from a consumer's standpoint, from, 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 a, from a behavior standpoint, can there be any other substitutes like the, the uh, trend of coffee or anything else perhaps? Um, and, and what is Dilma doing to perhaps reinvent yourself to be a part of that culture, to be a part of that lifestyle? Uh, are you embracing it? Uh, wholeheartedly and are you looking through avenues to be a part of that consumer behavior? Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. What the consumer likes most is what's best for the consumer. If the consumer says they like coffee, that's fine. I don't see coffee as a substitute for tea or tea as a substitute for coffee. But rather, I think that there are different occasions in the day when consumers like a coffee. If somebody likes to wake up in the morning and have a ristretto or an espresso, um, you're not going to substitute tea, um, however strong or intense you make it. So I think that would be uh, that would be a tough ask to to substitute coffee. But instead, what you see uh, looking at global Euromonitor data is that you have tea growing in coffee dominant countries. So I mean, we are supplying into Brazil, into Mexico, etc., places where a couple of years ago, you know, tea was uh, something you take when you're sick. And I can tell you. One of those places 10 years ago was uh, Czech Republic, where, uh, sorry, 15 years ago, where uh, our partners said, you know, when we have a bad stomach or when we are not feeling well, we take a cup of tea. So today uh, we are doing uh, almost a million dollars FOB value into, into that, that territory. But it's not by following convention. It's by looking, looking at, at uh, differentiated methods. It's about educating. So we've had we have schools of tea that travel around the world, of course, not since COVID, but we go into places, we talk, we, 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 we present the, the uh, allure of tea in a very contemporary way. It's not just about cooking with tea, it's about understanding. Most people don't even know how to make a proper cup of tea. You've probably seen some of the online, uh, the videos about uh, making tea. I mean, you know, they're laughable, some of them. You know, the, the basic principle of understanding the quality of water, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so we set up the School of Tea for that purpose. And what the School of Tea does is it looks at innovation, it looks at research and development, it looks at share, it, it looks at crafting unique experiences for customers, for uh, uh, professionals, for, for schools. We affiliate with the uh, uh, World Chefs schools, um, culinary schools, and so on. So uh, what we are doing is uh, trying to change that, that mindset trying to, to work around innovation to be able to, to, uh, to, to deliver. You know, it's, it's, um, I think, I think the, the thing is that if, if we accept uh, and try to compete within an existing framework that is uh, ultimately it's 150 years old, um, we're not going to have a great deal of success. So I think that's, that's uh, more, or less, uh, uh, more or less it. So what we try to do is we try to, to inspire with knowledge. And uh, as for substitution, the consumer uh, doesn't really, I don't think the consumer sees it as, okay, am I going to have tea or this? No, the consumer goes up to the shelf and says, hey, Dilma has come up with uh, uh, fabulous uh, turmeric uh, and pepper-based drink. I'm going to try it. I don't think they see in the same compartments that, that we do. And therefore, I believe that Ultimately, every beverage is substitutable for the other. It's just a question of how, uh, how, how engaging, how attractive, uh, how relevant, and I think relevance is key. We make it, and today there is no beverage, there's no herb that is more relevant to a 21st century lifestyle than tea. Look at the, it's unique in its level of antioxidants. It protects from Alzheimer's, uh, uh, all forms of uh, dementia. It protects from cardiovascular stroke, uh, cancers, what more can you ask? And this is all demonstrated scientifically evident. If you go on to PubMed, you're going to see that. So yeah, as for uh, tea becoming irrelevant, absolutely not. 
the biggest threat that we have is ourselves in not believing and not having the mindset to accept that tea is an incredible herb. We simply need to change our mindset and reimagine and say, look, what does a 21st century consumer want? We should forget about coffee, forget about competing with uh, alcohol pops, small beverages, etc. We need to focus on what is really great about tea and, con and everything that we think as being a uh, disadvantage, we need to reinterpret that because our high cost, it's a reality. Yes, we can't help. Yes, it's, uh, you know, people are going to, they, they lament, look, 80% of our product costs, our cost of production is labor. Yes, it is. So nothing you can do about it. It is what it is. But what you can do about it is try to market your way out of it. And that's by saying this is artisanal, it's handpicked, and making sure that translates into benefit for the workers concerned. And so then we tell the story. And by telling the story, you, re re you build trust in the brand and trust in the product. And there you have, I believe, in my opinion, uh, a solution. Dilhan, what's, what's your vision for, for the company? I mean, you're now in the driving seat uh, of the company. You're leading a large team. Uh, you, 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 are, you, you have now arrived globally. Everyone identifies your brand. Uh, and, and what's, what, what next? What's in store for Dilma? I think um, the, the, you know, what in a family business, first of all, you're, you're uh, never really in the driving seat. It's, it's uh, several people share the driving seat with you. And that's great because that's what family business is about. And we have three generations that are part of this business. Uh, and uh, I would say that in, in terms of what's next, it's really about reinterpreting the same principles that my father set down in the 1950s and in 1988 when the brand was first launched, reinterpreting it for this uh, 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 current uh, century. If you look at uh, tea gastronomy, many people will say, look, that's heretical. But ultimately, at the center of that concept, whether you use tea as an, uh, a base in producing uh, chocolate ganache or use it as a marinade in scallops. Ultimately, it's about respect for tea. And that is where, uh, so the same principle that my father espoused going back in time is what we do today, except in a different way. So today, tea gastronomy is about sharing the pleasure that he wanted to do, except doing it with chefs, but teaching them about texture, building the principles of taste, of texture, of components in tea, breaking it down, building the principles of pairing, building the principles of using tea as an ingredient, but actually going to, to, to it in quite a, uh, uh, in a professional way where this information hungry generation will accept it as being sincere and trustworthy. And so I suppose, uh, Short answer is it's more of the same, but uh, the long answer is that uh, it is reinterpreting what was laid down in uh, 1958 as the, sorry, 1988 as the uh, heart of the brand, reinterpreting it uh, from the lens or perspective of uh, Gen Z, the millennials, and so on. We have a lot of entrepreneurs and budding entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs are studying with us and a vibrant SME sector and entrepreneurship is obviously uh, a solution to an economy, a small economy like ours. Um, would you have maybe three steps, uh, a few points of advice that you'd like to give someone who's perhaps just started a website, has a big idea, uh, likes to go global, uh, maybe a commodity, maybe uh, export something else, perhaps even a service. What would be your recipe and you know points to watch out in terms of scaling up and doing well? I think for most people who ask me this question, there was a uh, uh, webinar last week also where it's, it's an unexpected answer. And it, I think the answer is humility. And I'm telling you that for two reasons. First of all, humility means that I can tell you that even today, the greatest research that we do on our product is by standing at a supermarket shelf. I do that every time I travel anywhere. You know, people tell me, oh, you travel, you know, you're, you're jetting around the world. It's not jetting around the world. It's standing at the supermarket, talking to consumers, 
hearing feedback, hearing people say, look, I hate this about this product. I don't like the color. I, we have buyers who've said, look, we don't like the brown on your Italian almond and we didn't list it therefore. That's relevant feedback. Of course, the, the buyer is important, but the consumer is uh, uh, just as important. And so standing and watching the way the consumer shops, we can't afford this uh, shopper marketing uh, uh, AI and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I know there's some amazing tools and if you can, fantastic. But for us, I think there is no substitute to watching and, and learning, exchanging communication with consumers, seeing con consumer complaints, consumer compliments coming in and responding to them. And th those are tools that my father always used. Humility is important because you should never say, look, I know it all because you never do. It's always the consumer. And I, I would never say that uh, uh, I know it all because the consumer teaches us something every single day and many times each day. But humility is also important because you need to understand that the, 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 what, what defines success is not uh, eventually. And, and if, you, if you have the right combination of vision, of passion, of commitment, perseverance, and so on, you will succeed. But what defines that success is not is not um, the trappings of success, you know, the, the nice car, the nice home, the nice uh, uh, clothes and so on, but actually it is the purpose. And I can tell you today that there's all this kind of uh, fancy terminology about purpose-driven business and, and so on. But the fact is that it is the purpose that ultimately drives your business. So with a combination of humility to understand what is your category, where is your passion, uh, what does a consumer expect? Because we can go out and say, look, we have the most incredibly magnificent tea from this estate in Nuarele. It's going to cost you $7. Consumer sometimes doesn't know how to pronounce. So if we offer a tea from Nuarelia in certain countries, it could either be mistaken for something else or it lacks recognition, lacks awareness, or they simply cannot pronounce it. And so what's the point? So there we need to change names. So we have value of kings, we have different. So understanding the consumer is critical. It is not only about uh, spending time on research. Of course, you, you do your uh, web research, that's for free and that there's some great resources, but observe, talk to consumers whenever you can ask them and say, look, would you like to try this? And that's something that we do. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I've, uh, uh, in New Zealand a few uh, months ago, just pre-COVID, we set up stands, we were tasting and say, test this, you know, what do you think? And then the consumer feeds back. And sometimes it's the most unexpected and bizarre comment, which is relevant. So my suggestion is humility to be able to absorb, to learn and, and, and to never uh, allow purpose to be uh, overcome by any sort of arrogance, the arrogance that usually comes with success. It is something that we must uh, all uh, uh, fight, but I, I, I would say that that's the, the key element, but then of course come the, the values, the vision, the commitment and so on, but always be uncompromising. Once you have put your plan together, whether you decide to position your product at a premium, a mid or a low level, you need to understand and make sure that all the different elements from the research development, the constant change, the, the evolution and the product cost itself, the supply chain, the, the, all of these different elements, the packaging, et cetera, that they are, once you understand that they're all aligned, then you need to persevere and say, okay, I am this. For, for example, as I mean, I, I, I can tell you many years ago, uh, while uh, we maintained our premium positioning, uh, there was, uh, there was a, a buyer, a regional buyer from Walmart that came and said, hey, you know, I'm going to buy this, this, and this, and I want this. They placed a trial order and they didn't give us control over the retail pricing and my father said stop it immediately you know we were like what are you talking about and he said no you have to stop uh, uh, supplying this customer we said they're the largest retailer in the world I mean, at the time uh, but uh, he said no and that was simply because they didn't allow us to position our product where it should be and actually that was an extremely wise decision because had they continued with what they were doing they would by now account for 40 to 50 percent of our total volume and uh, when they click their fingers, we would be dancing. So today we wouldn't be a Ceylon tea brand. We would be importing cheap tea and we would be mixing it and shipping it and we would have lost the heart of Dilma. So there is absolutely a critical requirement to be uncompromising once you have developed your, your plan.
So um, uh, Bilhan, in, in the last four minutes, have I missed anything in the, in the nice story, in this beautiful story of Dilma, the Dilma story? Have I missed anything that you'd like to share with everyone uh, in this journey? Uh, is there anything else that you would like to? I think, you know, simply bearing in mind that, that uh, I'm, I have this uh, extraordinary privilege of, of talking to some budding entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka, um, what I would like to advise you is we, are, we face a situation where we have greater volatility, policy inconsistency, uh, chaos in the markets. Uh, every day the exchange rates are changing because uh, Trump has tweeted or, or something, you know, there, there's something that happens somewhere, fires in Australia, whatever. So in this environment, building a sustainable brand is your best insurance against this kind of volatility. But the important part there is, with, with apologies to Louis, if, if, you, uh, if, if, if this offends you, throw away the marketing books. I mean, you know, you read books about amazing uh, uh, opportunities and, you know, they're all focusing on uh, what uh, this company, about what Apple did and so on. Forget about that. The practical business of marketing starts with the guy who's sitting uh, next to you, uh, tasting, sampling, the one supermarket that you go to, the, the kade that you might uh, be frequenting, it starts there. Take the first step because every journey, as you know, every journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. But that's important because we often miss the point. We go for the big, the big things, but we always forget that, yes, get one cafe, get the second and the third, and then somebody's going to see you. You're going to get a hotel. You need to understand the importance of practical and incremental growth. Because when you, if you get a chain of 100 cafes and you've made a mistake, you're in deep trouble. You could have legal issues. You could have so many. You start with one and you learn. You refine your product and your process and your marketing communication. And you go to the second and the third and you grow. That's really what we did. I mean, when I joined the business, we were shipping half pallets in some cases. But gradually, we... It, the business built. My brother and I, we aligned with my father's philosophy and the business grew and grew and grew. And of course, it's, it's, it's become an incredible, uh, it's been an incredible journey for us. I'm not saying that we are the biggest brand in the world. We are not. We are far from it. But we will continue to grow by keeping that mindset of humility, of constantly learning and also of persistence. Thank you so much, guys. I think we had a wonderful session uh, probably uh, the uh, second billionaire that, I, that I've had talking to us, uh, you know, uh, not only in terms of uh, the brand, but as a person, truly inspiring uh, and also uh, truly humble. Thank you very much for making the time. I, I, I understand you're still at office. Dilhan and and uh, you know it's 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 a Friday. That's meeting. the other thing. It's a regular thing. So don't expect if you're starting your own brand, don't expect to leave office before nine o'clock. And that's a reality. Absolutely, absolutely. I am also at office at the moment. Wonderful. Also, thank you, thank you very much, Dilhan. It has been truly thank you, Louis. a blessing. Uh, and 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 thank you so much for everything. Uh, and uh, you know, on behalf of all our students. Uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, we, we wish Dilma uh, to be the number one brand in the world uh, very, very soon under your leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you so much. Have a good night. Cheers.